Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready to dance? Yes. Yes. We're going to be doing some dancing this morning, not literally, but in our hearts and in our minds. And I want to read to you uh, from Meister Eckhart a thousand years ago about this, this energy that's pushing through all of us and where it comes from. He wrote, if you were to let a horse run about in a green meadow, that horse would want to pour forth its whole strength in leaping about that meadow. So too, it is God's great joy to pour out the divine nature and being completely into all of us, God's image. And so there's that desire to push out and to dance like a horse leaping around, a wild horse in a meadow. And, and just think about that desire for life, desire for expression, desire for, for your heart to sing and for your whole soul to dance. And you know, this, uh, this dancing business, I'm going to tell the dancing story uh, first, because I'm just going to, just want to tell you about it, just to set up the whole energy. Um, Jane Elizabeth Hart gave uh, a talk in, it was called Dancing with God, and so I'm kind of riffing off of her concepts, but she gave this talk to a rather unreceptive congregation about 18 years ago, or about, I guess, uh, 17 years ago. And um, we, it was a congregation where the idea of dancing with God was just not hitting it. So she's up there talking to them about dancing with God, and afterwards it was like she stuck a, a stick into a hornet's nest. It was like, we don't believe in dancing with God. What's that? It's an anthropomorphic God and all of this stuff. You know, the idea of getting really rigid and not seeing things as a metaphor or a poem, but seeing it very literally. So anyway, there was even one of the leaders of the church who said, we, she could not teach classes in this church. That person came in for counseling with her six weeks later. And she went on to become the most popular teacher in the church. But they had to get off their rigid positions, which is really what we're talking about here today, and learn how to dance. And they did. I get off my rigid positions together. I get off my rigid positions and I learn how to dance together. And I learn how to dance. You know, we think of people outside of Unity being rigid about religion, but I remember someone coming back from Unity Village and they learned the one true and right only way to do prayer treatments. And they came back and they said, this is the way everybody should be doing it. And I told them a parable. It's the parable of the three Sanskrit scholars in India who were walking down the road and there was a, a, a mendicant, a, a Sanskrit beggar, or a Hindu beggar, sitting by the side of the road, chanting the Vedas in Sanskrit, but not correctly. So as these uh, three scholars were walking along, of course they put nothing in his, his uh, begging bowl, but uh, one of them turned back and said, excuse me, you good man, uh, but I'm afraid your pronunciation is improper. Let me tell you, if you're going to do this, at least do it correctly. And so he corrected his, and the guys thanked him, didn't put anything in his bowl, and they went off, and they went to a ferry boat, and they're crossing the river. They're crossing the river, and they hear a splash behind them. It's the begging mendicant running across the surface of the water saying, excuse me, but I didn't get the pronunciation quite right. Could you run it by me again? <laughs> What's the moral of that story? Maybe it's not doing everything just exactly right. How many ways did Jesus pray? As many as there were people. There were times he spit in people's eyes. There were times he told them, show yourself to the priest. Other times he said, don't show yourself to anybody. Was he just terribly inconsistent? Or was the reality that this is a flow in life and we've got to learn how to dance? I've got to learn how to dance. Together, I've got to learn how to dance. So what we do, so what we're doing here is not getting so caught up in our footwork that we forget about the music and the rhythm and we lose the music and the rhythm. So, well, kind of kind of let that roll around in you while we're doing the circus here. I am open to the dance and I let the dance dance me. Together, I am open to the dance and I let the dance dance me. That dance is always flowing through each one of us, but you know, we, th we think of, of the spiritual dance in life as something... Uh, I don't know. People have a hard time with it. You know, Jane Elizabeth Hart talked about her grandfather, who was a very, very uh, rigid preacher. And he was such a rigid preacher, he couldn't keep a church, because he was too rigid even for the rigid congregations, because he was all about sin and damnation. And 
her mother raised her uh, in a little different environment. And uh, when she got to be about oh, eight, nine years old, she let her take uh, uh, dance lessons. Oops. So Grandpa said he would not ever come to the house or he would completely cut off the family, would not see any of his grandchildren uh, as long as this little girl, you know, you, you realize that you're sending this little girl to hell, you know? And, and her mother was, you know, really to stand up to the guy, but, but little, little Jane Elizabeth Hart said, you know, I don't need, she said, I, she didn't really like the dancing lessons anyway, but she's like, you know, I, I don't need to do this, but, but there's, a, there's a rigid view of this world that people don't like to dance, but you know what, dancing is part of the spiritual life, it's in the Psalms, and it's in the early church writings, there are many, many early church hymns early church round dances, the first couple hundred years A.D., they danced a lot. What happened to it? I don't know. But there's one of the early, early writings. It's not in the Bible, but most scholars feel that it's authentic because a lot of the early church writers refer to this. It's called the Dance of Jesus. And it's so beautiful because apparently it was a song. And it talks about Jesus playing a musical instrument. Did you know he was a he was a gigging musician? Yeah. Can you imagine that? You know, we think of Krishna playing a flute, but here Jesus is playing a flute. I'll just read it to you, but I'm sure that he sang it to them. I am the word who brings everything into being by my playing and dancing. Now respond to my dancing. Understand my dance by doing your own dance. If you won't dance, you'll never understand what I am doing. I'm playing my flute. Now all of you, start dancing. Everyone, it is your nature to dance. So all of you, dance. You, dance. Wouldn't that be nice to think that Jesus really said that? That's about a dance in life? And how do you dance that? He's telling you to dance, and certainly you could literally dance. You know, I, I'm not that good at dancing, except from I'm a deadhead, so I, I know that kind of dancing. You know? <laughs> there's no rules to that kind of dancing. I can get into that kind of dancing where there's no rules. But, but how do you dance in your everyday life? Maybe by being spontaneous, by not being locked down into methodology and thinking so hard about everything all the time. You know, I, I've shared before about the, the time that I took a, a leadership in a church that had had a lot of troubles. They had lost four ministers in an 11 month period. And the, my first day on the job, the woman in Betsy's position, nothing like Betsy at all, looked right at me. I hadn't met her before. She looked at me, she said, well, the sharks are circling. <laughs> and I said, what sharks? And she explained to me, well, they got the last four ministers. So I was dealing with some really, t I had stuff I'd never heard of before and I haven't seen since. And so I was very upset a, a few weeks after I got in there and I decided that I was going to do some serious, serious uh, journaling and, and work. And you know, that's, there's a time for all of that. But that's all I was doing. But I went down to the beach, and instead of enjoying the water, I lived across the street from a beach, but I, was, I had a clipboard, and I had a legal pad, and I was writing all my stuff out, and it was all fine and everything. And then and I asked them at 9 o'clock, how many of you heard me tell the story about becoming a dog? Raise your hand. Yeah, well, there not many there. Most of them at 9 did, but not many in this service. So I'll go into a little more detail. I don't tend to repeat these stories, but they're good ones. And this one was about being so caught up in my head. I was trying to figure out strategies, figure out my best understanding of things, trying to fix it with my intellect. How helpful is that when you're dancing? You just get all tripped up in your feet. You miss the rhythm and you miss the music. And so I was there missing the rhythm, missing the music, writing on furiously, and this dog came up and ran away with my flip-flop. And I, there were two other dogs with him, and he was looking back, and he thought he was really pretty cool. Well, I was really incensed. He was taking me away from my very important work I was doing. I mean, I was doing God's work. So I was running down the, the, the beach, and I, I finally caught up with him, but he was playing keep away, and they would, they would pass my slipper from dog to dog. And I couldn't, I couldn't get my slipper. And finally, finally, uh, I, I ended up getting it back. But, but then I looked at him, and I thought, hey, this dog wants to play. So, so we started playing with the slipper, and then I realized, hey, it's kind of fun. I'm feeling like I'm a dog. It felt good to be a dog. Wouldn't you like to be a dog once in a while? And so all of a sudden I looked at him and I went, Arr! and they started howling with me. And they're, oh, this guy is really a dog. And we were howling and 
we're having a great time. And then I remembered, I remembered what I came to the beach for. And I went back to my place with my slipper. And I started doing my work. And they kept coming up and nudging me. And I, I just said, go, go away, go away. I had important things to figure out, things to do. And finally, they took another one of my slippers. Then they ran away. This time he went way out in the deep water. Finally, when I got it back, he just looked at me and he just gave me a look like, you are such an idiot. You're too stupid to know how to be a dog. <laughs> and then they left. But, the, you know, I, it, it reminded me of something. I started thinking about it. And the pic image came of pots boiling over on a stove. Have you ever had like four or six pots all boiling over and you try to fix this one and this one boils over and you fix that one, you fix that one and, and you keep doing it and you keep working at it and whatever you do, there's always another one boiling over. Does your life feel like that sometimes? And you're trying to attend to all this third dimensional stuff, but what is the best solution when you've got six pots boiling over on the stove? Turn down the heat. Turn down the heat. How do you turn down the heat? Remember Mother Teresa would make her volunteers do one hour of playing and one hour of praying every day. Otherwise they couldn't stay there with her in Calcutta and do that work. It wasn't about being all serious all the time. And so I, I started, it took me a while to figure this out, but I started to do my, my meditation and doing my affirmations and doing that work, but also going off and playing every week, make sure I did something that was fun every week, and maybe not being a dog, but I got to be you know, in that flow. And it's so interesting, as long as I did that turning down the heat and attended to things and did the dance of life and saw it more as a dance, things worked out better. And when it didn't, when I didn't, it didn't. So, you know, somebody once said, you know, when I pray, coincidences happen, and when I don't, they don't. And so I, I, I got in touch with the solution to my problem. Thank you, God, for the divine solution to my perfect problem. Together, thank, thank you, God, God, for the divine solution to my perfect problem. But the early church fathers understood about the importance of dancing. It wasn't something that was forbidden like it was later on. And there's a wonderful answer to that particular quote from Jesus that was um, a song that was written by Mechthild of Magdeburg in 1200 AD. And she said, I cannot dance until you show me how, O oh Lord. If you want to see me leap around joyfully, first show me how you are dancing and singing. Only then can I leap in love, and from love into knowledge, and then into the harvest, that sweetest fruit beyond all human sense. And there I will dance with you, whirling. So how do you dance with God? Well, one of the things you can do is let go of your outcomes. Dancing is for the purpose of what? Well, unless you're on Dancing with the Stars or you're trying to win a trophy, uh, it's just for the purpose of dancing. And whether or not you do it physically, how can you do it spiritually? How can you be in that moment? Well, sometimes we say, well, I don't feel like dancing. I've got things going on. You've got to let go of that which is preventing you from dancing. I let go of that which is preventing me from dancing together. I let go of that which is preventing me from dancing. Carolyn Mace talked about a little eight or nine year old boy that she worked with. You know Carolyn Mace, the healer? And this boy had terminal brain cancer and he was told that it was inoperable. And he asked, inoperable, does that mean that I'm going to die from it? And they said, well, there's no guarantees on any of that. So we're going to work on this together. And she led him in, uh, in some prayer and some meditation, some visualizations. And, and, and he, he asked in prayer with her there, um, does this mean I'm going to die? And what he felt, he heard the words, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But it's up to you and it's, it's going to require three things of you to get better. First of all, you've got to spend a little time every day with me. Second, you've got to be nice to your little brother. And third, you've got to work on your healing every day. And she taught him to visualize and those visualization techniques of, of healing. And one visualization technique that was really, really helpful was, and he came up with this himself, was something out of Star Wars. Now, day before yesterday, Jason and I watched Star Wars Rogue One. How many people have seen Rogue One? You know, if you've given up on the Star Wars series, go see Rogue One. It's good and it's spiritual. It's not like that last one. So it's, it's really good. But in this one, he, this visualization, this little boy, saw himself as Luke Skywalker. And he was fighting the planet Meatball. 
and his tumor was the planet meatball, and he would shoot, you know, uh, his, his, va his phasers into it or whatever it was. And he did this work every day. Well, one day, he went to his mother and he said, Mom, my tumor's gone. And she said, well, what makes you think that? He said, well, I went into the planet meatball in my spaceship, and they were all lined up against me, and my guns were jammed. And I couldn't do anything. And I, I radioed for backup, for support, and I got, you're, uh, we're the ones who jam jammed your guns you're getting support, you're getting backup, and the planet people blew up, Mom, and I know it's gone. <coughs> and she said, that's, that's fine, dear, but you know, just keep doing your visualization. No, Mom, you don't understand. It's gone, and they took him in for a scan, and it was gone. You know, this, it's a playful attitude. It's an attitude of kind of letting go, of, of not being rigid about things. You know, where in your life do you find rigidity? You know, there's, there's one, one place that's sometimes rigid is churches. And, and one time I was in a church that was going through a really rigid time. And the staff was sitting together saying, what are we going to do? Because there was such rigidity. And so uh, we, somebody had heard about this one church down in Arkansas, Unity Church, that had broken free of a lot of old energy by turning the service around so that all the chairs faced the back of the room for one Sunday and did the service in the back and made everybody come in through the other side and it just changed the energy. Now sometimes doing something physical like that can really help, you know, move the energy on something. Well, we had nailed down, bolted down pews, so we couldn't do that. So we said, what do we do? Well, let's turn the order of service around. So we started the service with a peace song. And then we went into, you know, the, the talk, and we went all the way to make sure that the offering was later in the service, because late comers. But other, everything else. So uh, I'm just supposed to laugh at that. Um, but, so, so, so we, but we did everything. And you know what? There were people that came in late, and there was uh, two or three people walked in and said, I don't even understand what's going on in this church anymore. And bolted out the door and we never saw him again. But most of the people kind of got into it. And it was fun. And we ended up, you know, with the opening statement. And I mean, it's a, you think about it, you say, oh, he's not going to do that, is he? But you know, you're letting go and trying something new and trying, trying a new approach to your life. Being open to something new. Having, having a different way of doing things. And also being open to the idea that you don't have all the answers and maybe you need to let go of the pictures that you're holding. This is called letting go of your agenda and taking hold of a vision. Now what do I mean by the difference between an agenda and a vision? An agenda is my idea of the way things should be. And you know what? If you don't have an idea of the way things should be, maybe you need to create an agenda because it's important to have an idea. But there comes a point in the evolution of the soul when you let go of your agenda, which is on your clipboard and has all the things exactly the way you want it, and you turn it over and you receive a vision. Now, an agenda is about setting intentions, and intentions are good things. It's very good to have an idea where you're going. But a vision is about a soul desire, something that's higher, that's pushing through, that's wanting its expression in your life, and it's greater, different, and may, may be requiring you to let go of outcomes or let go of pictures. You know, I, my time that I tried out here in 1987, I was part of that situation. I'd been in my church for about three years, and I knew it was time for me to move on. And, uh, but I, the only church that was open that had uh, that for, for a, um, a senior minister was this church. And I'd always said to everybody, I will never be uh, an associate minister. I'll only be a senior minister because I don't want anybody else telling me what to do, right? Like that doesn't happen, right? So, uh, but I didn't. But anyway, uh, so, so I, was, I, was, I was sitting on my lanai. I was in Hawaii at the time and I was looking over the beach and I closed my eyes and I just, I just said, okay, okay, I surrender. What is it I'm supposed to see here? And what I got was, let go of all of your pictures. Now, how often do you get a, a feeling of letting go of all of your pictures? Have you ever had that happen? And how does it make you feel? Real secure? Real good? Well, I was like, what does that even mean, you know? So I went I went to, to my office, and in the mail that day came the letter from Unity Headquarters with all the openings, and there was an associate's position and I knew the minister involved in Palo Alto, near where my grandmother and my mom and my sister lived. 
And, but in an associate's position, I, there's no way I would do that. But I remember, like, go of all your pictures. Maybe that's it. Well, God, give me a sign. So I drove home. My answer machine was blinking. I pushed it, and it was the minister of that church saying, Greg, call me up. We're going to have some fun. We'll laugh about it because uh, I know you don't ever want to be an associate minister or anything, and, and why would you want to live where, leave where you are now? But he said, but, uh, but we wrote the job description with you in mind. And uh, so call, call me up, and we'll laugh about it. And I ended up going there. This was the other church I tried out in. And as much as I, I love this church, I needed to be with my grandmother. She was making her transition that year and, and uh, have those experiences of, of working in a very large church. Then when this church opened up again and I was looking for a position, that's where I came here. But letting go, letting go of your ideas. I remember when I was in ministerial school, they had us fill out a form saying, you know, what would you accept and would you not accept? Well, I would never be an associate minister. Check. I would never live in Los Angeles. My first church was in Los Angeles. And I would never live uh, in the industrial Midwest. Yeah, right. I don't think of this as the industrial Midwest. I don't know what you want to call it. It's not, no. But I spent five years in Detroit and I loved it. So letting go of your pictures, you say, well, but my pictures are good. These are, these are my intentions. But you got to let go sometimes of an intention and instead allow a higher soul desire to come through. And you say, oh, wait a minute, what does that look like? It's a willingness. It's a willingness. It's a flexibility. It's a willingness to do the dance of life, to not be locked into certain outcomes, certain ways of doing things. How does that make you feel? Just... Just be aware of, of any discomfort you're feeling now thinking, he's telling me to surrender. Now, I don't know, what is that going to look like? What it's going to do, it's going to be that place in your life that is the intersection between your spiritual growth and your service to humanity. And you say, but, but you're telling me i got to move somewhere? No, no, no. It could very well, and for most people in this room, means a different way of holding what you're doing right now. A different way of experiencing it but experiencing it as a dance in life and not limiting yourself and not limiting God. You remember the prayer treatment we did? Emma Curtis Hopkins wrote the last three lines, this too is God, this too is good, and I demand to see the blessing in it. I had somebody say to me, how do you demand anything from God? You're not demanding it from God. You're demanding yourself to see it because the blessing's already there. You say, but it's not to my liking. Ah, but there's something there that is hidden, that is ready to express. There's something in you that is hidden, that is ready to express. And it's a powerful expression of that being that you are. As, as I was reading to you from that, that wonderful expression from uh, Meister Eckhart, it's like a, a horse leaping about joyfully. In a meadow, there's that desire in your heart to express all of you, all of you, every aspect of you, your your whole being, your whole heart, and and there's a joy in letting that expression out. And so I'm going to ask you to take something out of your bulletins. I put this in this morning because this is a, a prayer treatment that I created once when I was um, in a, in a time where I was uh, moving into something new, and I had read these last three lines from Emma Curtis Hopkins. This too is God, this too is good, and I demand to see the blessing in it. And so I added some more prayer treatment affirmations before that, that really moved my energy out of my stuckness and up into a higher consciousness. So I'm going to ask that you pull this out, and we're going to say it together as an affirmative prayer statement, and you can feel the energy, you can move with the energy as we do this together. Has everybody got theirs now? Together? I now claim my good out of this. I now expect my blessing from this. There are no false actions in God. God is the source of all my good. I am lifted up out of my old consciousness. I am being pulled into my new sense of being. I am being lifted into my new mind. My mind is not going to limit God. This too is God. This too is good. And I demand to see the blessing in it. And then what do you do? You let go into the dance. Jane Elizabeth Hart, is a, she's the head for, of the Center for Enlightenment. She 
was an executive at Unity for years, a Unity licensed teacher. And the way it happened was that she let go into the dance. And the way that happened was her daughter had just graduated from college, lived in Detroit area, and um, was going to go in for an interview at Chi Chi's restaurant because it had a management training position open. How many people remember Chi Chi's restaurant? Raise your hand. Remember Chi Chi's? Okay, well, it doesn't exist anymore, and there are reasons for this. But anyway, she's, she's driving around, and she's going into what she thinks is Chi Chi's for her job interview, and she finds out it's not Chi Chi's at all. She didn't look at the sign. It's Hula Hands. And they said, well, why are you here? She said, I'm here for my interview. And they said, well, we don't have any record of this, but we do have openings in our management training position. Why don't you interview with us? So she interviewed with Hula Hands instead. They're headquartered in Kansas City. So they offered her a position uh, in, a, in, a, in a restaurant 10 miles from Unity Village, Unity's headquarters. Ah, so how did Jane Hart end up at Unity headquarters? She had a near-death experience. She almost died on the operating table and, and afterwards. And in her choice of deciding to come back and to be of service, what came to be very strong for her very strongly was to be a Unity licensed teacher. Well, they told her she had six months before she'd ever be able to drive again, but she was in her U-Haul truck six weeks later, driving down to Kansas City to live two miles from Unity Village in her daughter's house, who had gone there before her, and she went and became a, a Unity licensed teacher, got to work as an executive at Unity, and then retired to become the leader of Center for Enlightenment as my meditation teacher, and does this work, work now online for the whole world. But it was because, how could she have ever envisioned this as an outcome? But it's because she was flexible, she was loose, she was open. I've shared with you before about my sister and how she was just gone, she gone out to dancing one night and the people on the stage said, uh, we're gonna eat, we're gonna take a break. She said, where are you gonna eat? Here, oh, the food's lousy here, the best restaurant in San Francisco is a block away. Well, I'll take us there, it turned out to be they were just gigging as brothers, but they were a famous band. And they took her to, to uh, Boss Skaggs Club, and Chris Isaac was there, and they asked, both of them asked for her phone number. She said she couldn't figure that out. They're not looking for a date. Why did they want her phone number? They thought she was working for these people. And they offered her jobs, and they gave her jobs. They, they, and she ended up, and she's, you know, spent weeks with the Rolling Stones, and all that's Evelyn, and all Beatles, and Paul McCartney, and all these people, all because she was open. She had no idea. You know, being open to the dance of life, you have no idea what is going to happen next. I have no idea what is going to happen next. Together, I have no idea what is going to happen next. But it's going to be good. Together, but it's going to be good. And so it is. I'll just take a nice and deep breath and let it out. And just let go into the flow of life. Life is a dance. And we're dancing in the flowing dance of life. And we don't worry so much about our footsteps or footwork. We let go and we listen to the music. And we respond to it. We dance with life and let life dance through us. But in order to do the dance of life, we've got to let go of everything that's keeping us from dancing. Before Jesus could do the resurrection, he had to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He had to let go of something, release something. And so we let go, and we release. We let go and release our, our need to control every step. We let go and release our judgments about the way things are and the way they're going to turn out. And setting aside all our papers, we take another deep breath and let it out. And with fresh eyes and open hearts, we take these words silently, focusing on something we want to be free from, to lift up out of. Focusing something that perhaps has felt like it's 
and in the way of our deeds. And so as I say these words, just take them into your heart. I now claim my good out of this. I now expect my blessing from this. There are no false actions in God. God is the source of all my good. I am lifted up out of my old consciousness. I am being pulled into my new sense of being. I am being lifted into my new mind. My mind is not going to limit God. This too is God. This too is good. And I demand to see the blessing in it. As I let go into this now moment, I trust. I trust that God presence in me that knows how to dance, that God power in me that already is responding, that God awareness in me knows how to do this dance, and I let go of everything that may be in the way of my dancing. My heart is lighter. and filled with a great sense of calm peace. I lighten up, liven up, loosen up, and embrace the dance of life. I may move with this feeling in silence <coughs> as I move deep. Abundantly, and so it is. Amen. Amen. 